Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk about a uh, project that I'm involved in called the Samuel Sterile Project that's using the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing methodology. Uh, it's a science industry partnership with the large aquaculture industry in Norway. Um, many of you probably realize that uh, farm salmon is a, uh, is a global commodity at this stage. Um, just to mention, I'm at the University of Bergen and also a board member of the Nordic Marine Think Tank based in Copenhagen. So this uh, project has to do with the connection between, in many terms, man and nature. Here on this graphic, you see uh, the farm salmon on the lower right and the wild salmon in the Norwegian fjords. Uh, the wild salmon is currently endangered or has been endangered in Norway for, for many years whereas uh, the farm salmon is in the hundreds of millions of individuals in the fjord. The problem here is that there are millions of escapees every year. Actually, there could be millions of escapees in one single storm uh, along the coast of Norway. And there is a genetic integration, or this, uh, the, the pairing of the, the hybrid of the farm salmon with the wild salmon, which causes this integration. So the idea is to use uh, CRISPR-Cas9, the gene editing, for the basic science of understanding the basic biology of how gametes, uh, the sex cells, are produced. And when I started this project, uh, I'm in the RRI part of the project, or as we refer to it in Norway, the ELSA part, ethical, legal, social aspects of science. Uh, they, I was making the terms, okay, we're using GMO, GMOs in this project, uh, GMO, blah, blah, blah. And they said, Dorothy, Dorothy, stop. Listen, the GMO happens in the lab. Don't say anything in public connecting GMO to the market because that's not the case. And I said, okay, I was almost scolded. Uh, but I'm going to show you um, a video of it's kind of a, an ethnographic uh, observation ethnographic observation of what's going in the lab. Um, just there's these four steps I'm going to show you real quickly. Uh, the first is the CRISPR is uh, the idea of knocking out a gene. So they have some candidate genes where they want to knock out and then they, uh, so they make what they call the CRISPR construct. Then they inject this construct into the salmon egg. You wait one year and you see if the salmon grows up to be sterile. Now I'm going to narrate uh, this video that I took in the lab and this is going to be my best Hans Rosling impression. Okay, in the foreground we have the PhD student, and she is basically running the protocol. The, the woman who just sat down at the microscope, she is an industry member observing this methodology, and the other woman is a project leader. Now the PhD student now is reviewing the protocol about how she wants to put the buffer with the construct in the same vial, because she's then going to load needles to inject this into the salmon egg. So she's uh, doing that, and the project leader is doing some work in the background. That room behind there is the freshwater nursery where the salmon eggs are kept. And they're fertilized, and it's about two hours after fertilization. Here comes the master student, and she's in training in the Samuel Steel project, and she's learning basically today how to make these hollow micro needles that are made of glass. So now the PhD student goes to the sterile microscope so she can see the salmon eggs better. Again, they're fertilized uh, eggs, and she now is injecting uh, the plasmid, the CRISPR construct, into the egg, pressing on the petal, as you do like with, when you're sewing, to press the CO2 gas. Uh, so the, the GMO is basically getting in there. Uh, the project leader is also now doing another plate of uh, salmon eggs, her own. You see that micro needle. Now that plate is finished. She uh, dumps the eggs back in the fresh water to, for the incubation period of one year. Now she's filling her new tray with new eggs, fertilized eggs to inject. There's the eggs that have already been injected, and this happens 1,000 times for one experiment. So. That's just a little bit of insight of what is actually uh, happening. It's a lot of routine work, and the fact that you have to basically wait a year or sometimes even more to see if it actually worked. But the news is it does work. Uh, it took them a year to get it to work in salmon. Now, this was uh, the, uh, national news in Norway in the newspaper on Tuesday. On the left, you see some um, 
uh, a, a mature salmon, the control, and on the right here's the, the, the GMO, the knocked out gene where there's no uh, gametes produced. So this is, um, uh, yeah, it works. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, legitimacy, credibility, and saliency. And uh, first on credibility, there was an interesting um, editorial in Cell, the edit editor-in-chief, uh, where she says, credibility is everything for science, and it's built over time in both obvious and subtle ways. It's how we interact with colleagues and collaborators. Most importantly, science contaminated with lack of credibility is a house with crumbling walls that engenders little trust and provides minimal value to our global society, present and future. On the topic of legitimacy, I, I've done some interviews with uh, people in the project, and one of the scientists uh, said to me, for example, um, they, the industry partners, they're interested in possibilities and new products, meaning vaccines. But then we also need them in the industrial development part, and this is what the research uh, council wants, and basically implying that that's the reason we got funded. And so make a point here that the legitimacy of doing CRISPR, the, uh, the gene technology, is accepted by the Research Council of Norway only when the agriculture and the vaccine industry companies are partners in doing it uh, together. Which brings us to a little bit of, of saliency, or the relevance of the science and technology to governance. And uh, Asha et al. have a paper in 99 uh, referring to Norwegian agriculture and the role that government has in offsetting market failures in research and development to ensure a socially desirable level of innovation activities in areas where the industry is unlikely to internalize to a sufficient extent. So there, obviously there's um, a role there for the, for the research funding. Uh, these are the partners in the Samuel Sterile project, and we can see that actually half of them are industry partners. Uh, that being said, the, um, I'm not sure what part of the, how much work is actually done by the industry. They're actually watching and observing uh, what's going on. Now the science is in place for them to develop a vaccine, so they will probably be taking more over, but the project only has about uh, six months left or so. So um, that will probably be the next funding scheme actually developing that vaccine. So uh, as I... Uh, We'll, we'll get to this point here. So what happens to science and quality assurance, trustworthiness, and communication? Uh, part of my uh, technique that I have been trying also with uh, Jeroen van der Sloos, who is also the work package leader, uh, is bring scientists out into society through art. I'll show you some of that. And then bring society into the lab with vignettes. So what we did in a workshop that we just had on, um, in January is we went to the uh, art museum. Kuda, and I had the scientists, we were a group of like five, I had them wander around for an hour and a half. They had free, free time, and their, their job was to look at pieces of art and see if they can relate the Samuel Sterile Project or Norwegian agriculture to uh, a piece of art, to see, them, see what art was trying to say or whatever. So in this top part, uh, we have this Norwegian artist, Old Nedrum, and uh, this is the man with a horse head. And they were asking themselves the question, uh, is the man with a knife, does he, has he severed the horse's head? Did he do that or did he just find it like that? Is his expression that of shock or of awe? And they saw this as a representation of dystopia of the relationship within, with man and nature. And then we were super lucky and got this really awesome uh, um, feminist exhibition by Sukar Mural of Turkey uh, with Christ Pregnant. And they saw this as a metaphor for perhaps male domination in science and industry, and also these dead human bodies that were displayed um, as a metaphor noir for uh, slaughtered salmon. And then Tony Matelli from New York on his um, Total Terror Mad Malaise, uh, Salmon Farm critiques that they've often pointed to deformities and yeah, frankenfish and the, these type of things of farm salmon. And they saw these, uh, this is a self-portrait after a drinking binge that the artist had. And uh, they gave this uh, associations to the deformities that are naturally found in nature. One final uh, point is this point of slow science because I know Matthias is a big um, supporter of the idea. Uh, I took this picture of two of scientists in the project that just stopped, and I think they were here for maybe 10 minutes on their own, gazing at this, um, this work, which is actually, you see, a, a close-up of what this work actually is. They liked this work because it reminded them of 
calm, collective uniformity, even though when you get up close to it, there's all the complexities and intricacies, intricacies, sorry, you know what I mean? Um, and I, I just thought that this was a really nice way for us to engage in slowing down and allowing for those reflective spaces to actually happen. I'm just going to mention one thing uh, about techno-moral vignettes uh, before I finish um, with uh, colleagues at the, uh, uh, at the Rathenau Institute. Um, we had this 20-year dystopia, and if I have time later, I could read, uh, read that to you. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>